Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome to the Life's Best Medicine podcast and the Low Carb MD podcast. I'm doing two today. We're, we're getting dove for two. And I have a special co-host today, Linnell Lenskis, my wife. She's, she's, she's stepping in for Tro. Linnell, welcome. This is kind of cool. Thank you. I'm just kind of scary. You, you finally invited me to be on your podcast. Yeah, it's good I mean, to this, be here. This is the person who knows more about me than probably I know. So, <laughs> so in our other special guest, obviously, David Feldman. It's funny because Cynthia Thurlow was talking about you and, and, and some of your stuff. And I've seen you on Twitter, all your positive and great messages. And I was thinking, oh, she spelled David Feldman wrong. What an embarrassment. Because you know, Dave Feldman's a guy in the low-carb community who I respect a lot. Yes. And I realized, David, who's that? And I started looking at your stuff. And I was like, wow, that's super, really cool. Very, very important stuff. I mean, people, you know, my job as a doctor is to look at the entire person. And a lot of people neglect to say, how are things at home? And sometimes when I say that, tears come and, and, you know, you see the stress and all those things. And, and so I've been very blessed in my marriage and uh, my wife may say something different, but, (laughs) but, you know, it's one of those things where I realize the importance of that in in overall health. So David, welcome. And and thank you for all all you're doing. And I know you're, you're, you you can give your, all your credentials, but building great marriages, uh, that's your tagline. And I think that's really critical. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I have been confused many times for Dave Feldman. Uh, it's just very funny. I say hello to him every once in a while because sometimes people will at me and they'll say his name instead of mine. So we bump into each other a lot on Twitter. So that's great. Yeah. So tell, so tell people about you. Tell them tell, <laughs> how did you get into this realm and how did you see the importance of really focusing on on marriage as as being critical? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I've been, I like to say that I've been a therapist my whole life. Uh, I grew up in a house where my father, um, he used to be the go-to person for uh, teenagers that were my age and my friends, and they would have problems in relationships or with their parents, and they would go into, they would go meet with my father. We'd all be there in a group, and my father would give his counsel and wisdom. And oftentimes he knew their parents, which was very interesting because I, the things I was hearing him say versus him as a parent, you know, and he just really taught me and showed me the importance and the uh, critical nature of relationships towards our, our happiness. And of course, since I'm on your show, our overall health, and it was a priority for him. I started my career as a, as a more of a computer slash tech, technical entrepreneur. And um, I still do that. So, so to speak, but my my passion is I went back to school and I have just like you have those certificates behind you. I see all those wonderful signs, so I have mine. <laughs> and uh, I decided at some point, and I reached middle age, that I decided that I was going to um, focus more on human relationships more than just keyboards and code and technology. So that has been something really exciting for me. And uh, even though I, you know, I, I, I decided to take my trade and see how I could do on Twitter. And I started about a couple of years ago, maybe three, you know, 2017, 2018. And what I noticed was that there was such a negative atmosphere around marriage. You know, it was like there was like this real big dichotomy, so to speak, in the social media space. There was either people that were very religious and Christian or you know, Muslim that were big into marriage and were talking about it from that angle. And then I noticed also there was like these red pill communities and um, more, you know, divergent communities that I would say that would speak negatively about marriage. And I just didn't feel there was a voice for your average man um, out there in, in Twitter and in social media in general, that really felt positively and wanted to help people who wanted to be married have a successful marriage. You know, there was a lot of stuff about getting out of marriage or getting into it, a lot of dating guides and how to get a girlfriend, things like that. But what about the rest of us? I mean, <laughs> all of us, we tied the knot years ago and we're fumbling through life or we're successful in life, whatever. But our relationships, like you just mentioned, can sometimes take a back seat to what we think is our priorities in life. And as, as my father once mentioned to me, he says, when everything else is going well, um, he, he, said, he said, 
I said to my father once, my father later on in life ran into some money. So I asked him, I said, you know, has becoming wealthy affected your happiness? And he said to me, he says, yes. He says, but I just want to let you know when your relationship, it only affects my happiness when my relationships are going well, when my marriage is going well, and when my kids are doing well. This is, if those three things aren't doing well, all the money in the world isn't going to make me happy. And uh, a lot of us are in the same boat. You know, we put prioritizations on other aspects of our lives, which is also important, but we need support for our most foundational and the most important ingredient of our day-to-day lives, which is our marriage. So I decided to put my, you know, two cents in the hat and see what I could do. Yeah, and that's critical. And, you know, Linnell can speak to this too. You know, what for me, I was in a successful practice, 17 years, working 14-hour days, just killing myself. On the weekends, I didn't have time for a lot of stuff. And I was like, it's not worth it. You know, I said, Linnell, look, I'm thinking, well, actually, I had already resigned my position, but I gave a six-month notice because I had to because I had partners because I couldn't just leave. Right. But um, she said, go for it, honey. I mean, I go, it's going to be a massive pay cut. And she's like, go for it. You could tell Linnell to tell the story. Mm-hmm. I just, um, that, that's, what's most important to us. We've been together since high school, but married, uh Oh, <laughs> 25, years? 25 years. I'm not sure. Maybe going on 26 years and, um, money is never, and I'm, I feel fortunate that we're both on the same page on, on this one. Money has never defined us. It has never been, we've never, I, we've never had an argument over money. I mean, really, I don't, if we have, I, it was minimal. I don't remember. We've just never had, it's never defined us. It's just always been. And we've dug out of debt. Like I had, you know, she was, and this is the other thing talking about marriage. When I was going through med school, I had no income. Obviously I'm in med school residency. You don't make any money. So she was our breadwinner this whole time. Right. She never said, you know what, I'm busting my butt working and you're just going to med school. Right. But it was never like that. So then when I started making more money, it was like, never like, okay, I make more money than you now. So here's how it's going to be. Right. So, cause a lot of marriages I've seen that happen where the breadwinner kind of takes control and goes, okay, I, I make the rules of the house now type thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I like in, um, everybody's got their own, just like, and you probably see this with health as well, you know. Um, I'm sure you've met people who have not abided by the kind of plans that you put out in terms of your health protocol and are honestly quite healthy. You know, it, there's no one way, at least the way I see it, there's no one way that people can have a, a wonderful health life as well as a wonderful marriage. But there are some guiding principles that really make a big difference. You know, and um, and just like just like in health, you know, eat natural foods, you know, cut down on the sugars. I mean, y- you know, your your podcast is all about that, and it's the same thing with marriage. And that's really the the position that I take on Twitter. Like I like to bring to the to my audience and to people who I have relationships with basic information on how to establish a connecting, loving, and intimate relationship with another person. And uh, it's, 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 it's sometimes when you hear it, it's obvious wisdom, but um, oftentimes um, it's things that we take for granted and things that we don't focus on. And those are the big ticket, big ticket issues that sometimes I see, oftentimes I see pull people apart. And, and what do you think that, what are the things that you've noticed, like when people come in and their marriage is a total train wreck, what are the big things you've noticed that are the most detrimental? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So um, I see, I like to break things down in kind of what I would say um, positive attributes. And then on the other side would be negative attributes. And I can relate this to a diet as well. Things that you should be eating and things that you should not be eating, right? So it's the same thing here. For me, the number one issue that I deal with, that I see that my clients struggle with, the number one is gratitude. That is the single most, um, now again, I'm talking about married couples, right? So I'm talking about two people who already fell in love with each other, who already know that their spouse is not a uh, psychopath or a narcissist or things like that. You're already married five, 10 years. Why is it that we fall out of love? Why is it that we become bitter? Why is it that we become angry? Why is it that we see our partner in a negative eye? And most of the time in my experience is that we have um, disassociated ourselves from the appreciation that we had when we first met our partner. And um, 
that's my number one thing that I work with people on when they first come into therapy with me or just even a relationship with me is teaching people how to re-see the beauty in their partner. It's huge. And I have this guide that I have on my, on my website. If somebody, you know, you can go to my website and download it. It's, uh, creating, it's called Creating Amazing Appreciations. And I, you know, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll get an email every once, you'll get a tweet every once in a while that says, you know, sign up for my email list. And I have this technique, this methodology that I use to teach people how to create and how to show appreciation. The first step in appreciating your spouse is the most difficult, and it's called noticing. I know it's crazy, but you wouldn't believe how people don't even see the beauty of what's sitting there in front of them. I'll give you a story. So the other day I was working with a woman and she's, you know, on the phone with me and she's, you know, he did this and he did that. And he told me he was going to do this and he told me he was going to do that. And the last time I had asked him this, and can you believe what he said to me this and that? So, you know, I, I, of course, as a good therapist, I listen and I empathize and these are all, you know, too bad. These are not unfortunate things, you know, there's no question about it. So, we get to the appreciation section of my the session. So I say, okay, name me five things that your husband did for you today that you could be thankful for. Silence. <laughs> There's nothing there. Me? He didn't do anything. Da, 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 you know? Can you believe what he said to me? Da, da, da. So I said, well, where is he right now? So he's at work. I said, oh, so he supports your family. Yeah, yeah, he supports my family. Okay, good. And so he's a supporting husband. Yeah. So I said, when did he leave for work? He, she says, he always leaves right around nine. So I said, oh, so he's responsible too. So you married a responsible man. And she said, yeah. I said, okay. And did he say goodbye to you and the kids before he left? Yeah, he did. He always does. Every morning he says goodbye. So I said, oh, so, he, so he's a family man. He's somebody who cares about you and, and his children. And I said, is he going to come home after work? No, no, no. He usually likes to go to the gym before he gets home from work. Oh, so he takes care of himself and he's, he's health oriented. He's health conscious about his family, about his health. And she said, yeah. And by the time we finished, you know, her whole mind had shifted about who this person was. And I said to her, this is the paradigm. These are the lenses that you want to wear when you look at that man. I said, if you wear these lenses, you will have a happy marriage. If you continue to talk about him the way that you are, which is fine, everybody needs an outlet and everybody needs a friend to you know, complain the two and stuff like that. But if that becomes your primary, your primary vision that you see him through, you are going to be unhappy. This has nothing to do with your husband. This has to do with you. If you want to be happy, you have to see him in this light. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, that that's a huge thing. That's huge, you know, and, and that's the same thing for Linnell and I, you know, when I go somewhere and I meet people for the first time and Linnell's told them about me, when I walk in, they're like, oh my God, they're genuinely excited to see me and happy and they, because she's been, you know, she may not give them the whole story, but but what I'm saying is she's selling me and saying, look, my husband's awesome. He does this. Like, so they know instead of saying, oh my gosh. So I've been in conversation with guys and they'll say, oh my gosh, my wife's the worst. You know what she does? And they start going and, and then all of a sudden they get to me and I was like, sorry guys, I don't have much to contribute to this conversation, right? Because, you know, we're very fortunate, like those little things, like you said, noticing, like, you know, like our things like whoever brushes their teeth first puts toothpaste on the other person's toothbrush or whatever, just being kind and serving yeah. each other. And we both want to be able to serve each other more. And yeah. I think that's, that's great. Lanella, what, what's your input on well, that? As, as Dovid was talking, I, I thought, man, it's not that you or I are that much more amazing than anybody else because we're not we have our we definitely have you know each of us have our our stuff but as dovid was talking i thought man we wake up every morning with that perspective with those lenses i don't i i can't think you're not perfect brian um by any stretch of, we'll of the that, imagination we'll but <laughs> but i can't think of five things that are negative about you right now. I can think of so many that I'm so thankful for. Um, so that is the paradigm. Th those are, that's the lens I look out of on a daily basis. And I know you do too, because I feel your love from the moment you wake up, you know? So we're blessed. We are very, very 
I'm grateful in that way that that that's the lens we wake up with and the lens we go to bed with, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's really beautiful. And then, and, and, and not only that, not only do you two, are, am I seeing that, you know, from what you're expressing that this is your primary way of seeing each other, which is definitely puts you at a, at a great advantage in terms of your relationship. I mean, it makes you happier, right? When you're, when oh, yeah. you're, yeah, you're happy, right? You're mm-hmm. happy to be married to. And this has nothing to do with Brian. It's not that Brian is such a great guy. I'm sure he is, <laughs> But you're the one who's blessed because you are happy with your husband. Mm-hmm. You know what, Dovid? I'm, I'll even go beyond that because there's days I'm not happy, right? <laughs> but every time I either disagree or I feel like, oh, he didn't say, to, he didn't say that very nice. You know, I know I, I always, this is one of my things that I do on a regular basis if I don't feel happy in the moment, um, cause we're not always happy, but I always go back to, I know that I know that man loves me yes. because of his character and because of his reputation with me, because of the way he treats me. So, you know, it, if I don't feel happy in the moment, I always feel loved by him. And, yeah. and so, um, you know, that's, that's perspective. That's a yeah. choice, you know, it's, yeah, and, I, and I think that also carries over to other relationships. Like we're very good. If we like someone to say, they didn't mean it that way is, but mm-hmm. someone you don't like, or someone who rubs you the wrong way, they say the same exact thing and you react, mm-hmm. right. Cause you say they're being a jerk and they have some underlying motive for saying that. Right. They, and, and so I think that's very true too. And those carry over to other relationships. A hundred percent. I mean, not to get into the big political thing that's going on now, but we see it as a nation as a whole that, Mm -hmm. you know, one person can do one thing and then everyone's like, you know, people who like that person say, Oh, well, that wasn't a big deal. And that, I don't understand why you're making, why are you getting so ruffled under the feathers? Right. And then the other person does it. And then that team Mm -hmm. is just like, Oh, well, this wasn't, you know, you know, he or she didn't really mean it, or this wasn't, so why are you taking it out of context? I mean, we all have that ability to justify but that's the goal of marriage. We should always be justifying for our partner in the positive, right? That's what we're trying to accomplish, you know? And it's like, and, and one thing that I think is wonderful with what I'm hearing from you two also is that um, it sounds like you let each other know, you know, it sounds like, like when, when you met, when you just gave that story, you know, your wife had just laid this red carpet down for you when you walked into this room and you know that you, she's already talked up about you and, and mm-hmm. made you feel, Brian, like you're a million bucks when you walk in there and people saying, wow, it's so nice to meet you and you're such a special mm-hmm. person. You get all this reinforcement. I was just working with this gentleman who, uh, great guy, you know, married for, I don't know how many years, 10 years plus, And, you know, I, I introduced him the idea of gratitude. He goes, oh, I already feel this way about my wife. And, and I said to him, you know, give me five things that uh, your wife did for you that, was, that, that, that you feel appreciative for today. He rattled them off no problem. So I'm thinking to myself, wow, well, like, this is interesting because she's complaining that, you know, she's not feeling it from him. And meanwhile, he's got all these feelings. So I said to him, okay, I, I pushed forward anyway. I said, this is your homework assignment. You know, I want you to, I gave him my guide and we worked through a couple of gratitudes. I helped him write some. And I said, I want you to express these to her and see what happens. And part of the homework that I give is, he, you know, he has to text her these gratitudes. And then I like to take a screenshot. I don't know, Brian, sometimes you've probably seen on Twitter, I put these screenshots up of uh, conversations that my clients have. I always get permission. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so he, he took a screenshot. And what was her response? He said something about how wonderful she treated the children or whatever it was. And her response was, wow, I'm so surprised you feel that way. I never knew that you thought this about me. Mm-hmm. And she says, yeah, you know, I, I really do try hard and I'm so happy that you're noticing. And for, for him and for me, it wasn't so much for me because I was suspect that this was the case, but for him, it was an eye opener. Mm-hmm. Even though he had already known these things about her, because he wasn't communicating it to her, she was totally unaware of this is the way her mm-hmm. husband, who loved her and cared about her, really felt. And that makes sense why she had trouble finding good things about him because he wasn't saying it, right? It's funny because I learned a lesson from my dad a long time ago. He he worked for a big company and, and uh, this guy was up for a raise and his boss said, what do you think of this guy, Rudy? And my dad said, well, you know, he, he gave every negative aspect of this guy. And the boss looked at him and said, well, I'm really surprised because he only had great things to say about you. 
<laughs> and he said he felt like he was an inch tall because he realized he totally sold the guy out rather than saying all of his good qualities that were good. He focused on all this stuff saying, these are the red flags that it could be if he takes that position, not thinking like, I'm not giving a good representation of who this person was. And he said it changed his life at that second. It's like, I will never do that again to someone. Yeah, it's a huge shift. There's this other, um, as, as you were talking, Dovid, I, I could relate it to our own, mine and Brian's um, marriage when probably first year, second year we were married. Um, I, I did my darndest to make sure he knew how much I loved him, um, to be able to communicate what was actually in my heart and, and have him feel it. And, um, there was a point where, I mean, I make him coffee every morning, make him lunch before he went off to, you know, school and, um, dinner when he came home. And I just wanted to express. And at one point, he said to me, I don't know why, but I feel disconnected and I don't feel like, I don't know if he said you love me or it was something like that. And I thought to myself, I don't know how I could possibly show you more how much I love you because there's so much in my heart for you. And we, we were able to figure out through, um, you know, peers of ours and just wisdom I think it's really good when you when you have people that you can trust and that you already know have gone before you and and you're seeing success to to have those mentors. And um, someone said, you might not be speaking his language, you know, because you serve, you love to serve. And that's how you show people how much you love them by serving them. Maybe he doesn't receive love that way. Maybe he sees you so busy that you don't have time for him, you know? So we were able to figure out, I thought, huh, he sure likes to spend a lot of time with me and I'm so busy serving him. I don't have a lot of time to give him. Maybe he wants my time. So it was figuring out how to speak each other's language too and how to, um, wasn't that I didn't love him. I just wasn't doing it the way that he was hearing it or receiving it. And we had to figure that out. Yeah. And she, so she got me, gave me this book. It's called the five love languages. I'm sure you came across <laughs> that. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm looking, I was in med school at the time. So I'm thinking, my gosh, I got too many things to read. I got, I'm just going to add this, this. Yes, honey, I'll read it. I'll read it. Then I read and I was like, Oh my gosh, because that was so true because my thing was, I just want to have quality time with you. I want to sit down, chill, talk for 10 minutes, not be running around. You're doing the dishes. We can't even sit and focus on each other. And for her, it was acts of service. So I learned if I get her flowers, she doesn't care. It's like, okay, why'd you spend money on flowers? But if I say, you don't sit down, let me get the dishes. I'm the king for the night, right? So good things happen, right? So we realized, oh, acts of services was how her and, and our daughters both have different ways of feeling love. One loves gifts and she'll wrap it up and make it all nice. The other one doesn't care about gifts, but she wants to sit and talk to you or say, oh my gosh, you did words of affirmation saying, oh my gosh, you did so great on that. And she glows for a week, right? So it's amazing how, how many in marriages I see, it's like, have you like told your wife that you love her? And there's this saying that the Norwegians are very stoic. And it says this Norwegian guy just loved his wife so much. Every day he just loved her. He almost told her one day that's how much he loved her, right? So he, it, it's sometimes it's just saying the words, right? Of what you're feeling. Yeah, hundred percent, you know, and uh, certainly acts of kindness go a long way. And um, you know, intimacy. These are all. These are all. You know, Doctor. I think it's uh, Gary Chapman that wrote that book, and um, you know, groundbreaking in many ways because it really helped all of us break out of our own paradigm of what love means. You know, and and that brings me on to like another point, which I think is so important because the what makes I've heard people say, oh, well, that you know, the love languages don't work. You know, and. Um, and, and that can be said about anything, including including your protocol for health, right? Oh, you know, reducing carbs doesn't work, you know, or intermittent fasting doesn't work. So, what I think is what I think is so pivotal is that you know, oftentimes people roll into marriage thinking that marriage is an extension of my feelings and our dating life. You know, we 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 started dating casually, then we made each other you know, uh, primary, you know, there's, we, we became whatever it's called, we're singular with that person. And then, you know, we've been dating for a while and now it's time to get married. Meaning it's like this progression. And I like to help people think of marriage totally differently. Marriage is not a progression from this emotional affair that you had originally, and then you've become monogamous with each other. And then you've decided to take the next step and get married. Marriage is a completely different 
animal, completely different period of your life. It's a completely different level of commitment and sacrifice. It's not an extension of dating. It's, a, it's something which, which stands on its own two feet. And to understand marriage and to be successful in marriage, we have to go way beyond whatever our thoughts and our patterns were before we got married. That's why you see so many people that dated successfully for five or seven years and then they get married and they're divorced in two years, right? Or they say after they get married, well, I didn't ever knew this about this person. Like, or you, they say, well, I married the wrong guy. Well, how long were you dating for? Oh, we dated for five years. I mean, it, marriage brings out a whole different level of connection and commitment between, between couples. And um, if a person isn't ready for that level and they don't want that level of sacrifice, I mean, the reason why your love languages work so well was because, um, Linnell, when you found out that, you know, he wanted, that he didn't want service and he wanted connection, for the sake of us, mm -hmm. you were willing to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you put your own ego, your own vision, your own personality, so to speak, on the side. Mm -hmm. And you said, I'm investing in this relationship that we have that's greater than me and greater than Brian. Mm -hmm. And for the sake of that relationship, I am going to twist and turn. Mm -hmm. I'm going to learn to see things differently and I'm going to learn to behave differently. Mm -hmm. And Brian, I'm sure you've done that countless of times. Mm -hmm. That's the, that level of commitment. We don't, we don't commit to somebody because we love them. We love somebody because we're committed to them. And that's, mm. the, we see the power and marriages that have lasted through these generations. You ask them, and yes, it's the love language. And yes, it's the, this, and, and it's the John Gray. And it's the, you know, all the different wonderful techniques that are out there. It's all those things. But above and beyond that, it's the commitment to the relationship itself that's recognized. This is not just about how we feel about each other. We are building something together, which is greater than the two of us. And we are both going to have to sacrifice for this. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of your tweets on these kind of things. When you say, look, if you were stuck on an island together, you would have to make it work. Like you're stuck and that's it. Like so many people are looking for that next island to jump to and they're, mm -hmm. they're waiting for that next better thing to come. I've seen that so many times. Like, you know, the, the classic story, and I see this all the time uh, where a, a guy becomes successful and goes, ah, oh, I don't need her anymore. I'm making tons of money. I'm going to move on to the next thing. I'll get a, a wife that's half my age. And then all of a sudden he gets old and I see it. And now she's like, what am I doing with this old guy? I don't need this old guy. And so I'm going to go to find a young guy who wants to go to the concerts. This guy wants to sit and watch TV and sit on the porch, right? right. So you see those kind of things where people think that they deserve better at some point in their marriage. Yeah. Right. When they look at their marriage as if it's like an, um, an, an accessory to their life or a part of their life. No, your marriage is the means. And if you want to get spiritual, you know, in, in more Jewish Kabbalah, which is mysticism, you know, um, the whole paradigm of God's relationship to, the, to, the, to humanity is encapsulated through marriage. You know, the masculine and the feminine from above to below, the, the giver and the receiver, you know, the dynamic where, where through the interaction itself, we elevate not just each one of us, even though we're not elevating God, but we elevate ourselves but we also elevate the entire world around us in that process. You know, what, um, a successful relationship between a man and a woman is the entire way through which the whole world becomes greater and more elevated. And that's from a spiritual perspective. And we also see it in a physical perspective as well. Marriage, study after study after study after study shows that with offspring and children and relationships and overall happiness, even for men and overall health, since this is a health channel, you know, um, shows that, you know, marriage has got a beneficial effect on so many different levels. What do you have to say about that, Linnell? About the faith part of it? I think we have a great story on that also, I think. We do. Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe I was the only one there. I'm not sure. But, but you know, in high well, school, I, mean, she, I don't know what you you're, know, I was a football talking. player. She was in uh, you know, doing drama stuff and she was uh, a cut ahead of me, I would say, like out of my out of my range. Right. 
And so I found out she liked me and they, so we go through all this stuff, but I asked her out finally after knowing she liked me for a year, I asked her out and she's like, well, I'm, I have a church thing that night. And I, and I wasn't a church guy. And I said, Oh, that's, I think I'm thinking I got some misinformation because who's going to go to <laughs> church rather than having a date with me. Right. <laughs> so I got turned down by this girl, but we dated through high school. I mean, I was a, I'm younger, even though I don't look like it. I was a junior. <laughs> she was a senior. I, I, it was cool back then to have an older girlfriend. Right. So, uh, it's still cool though. Um, anyways, uh, so we start dating and we go through college and I don't think we really appreciate what we had uh, after graduating. We broke up for a year, right? Cause we were kind of a disaster off and on because she had religious beliefs that I didn't believe. And in that year we broke up event after event, after event, I become a Christian guy. Right. And so she calls me one day out of the blue says, I think we should like have lunch and our dinner and just kind of talk this out. And then we realized the connection was still there and things had changed. And since then, our relationship was totally different than it was in our younger years, in the college years, you know, conflict was gone and all this kind of stuff. And, and then a year later we get married. Right. So, so, and then right before med school, which is the most stressful thing. And I was putting, we, we dated for eight years off and on. I mean, for that time, that one year off, but the rest of the time together, but because I realized when you go to med school, the stress and the tension, all that, like if you don't have a solid foundation, you're in big, that marriage is gone. I've, I saw so many divorces in med school and residency. It was, you know, for me, it was a peace mm -hmm. coming home. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So that, mm -hmm. that's what I was referring to. <laughs> Why well, wasn't we I mean, <clears throat> I could share a story a day about our faith and, and, and um, you know, the blessings that, that we have, but um, I'm curious, David, um, because the question that that you were answering um, of the main thing is gratitude um, that you come across. Um, what is what is the next thing? Um, gratitude and because there is one thing that I I feel like um, uh, at some point in time. Um, I don't know if this is something that you see often, but I feel like I I see this in marriages when they say, "What is your what is the key to to you guys being um, having such a successful marriage? And so the gratitude is one. But for me, it's always show, just being respectful, not crossing that line of even if you are angry or upset to to watch the words that come out of your mouth and that that lack of respect that that um, you could have for for your spouse. Do you see that a lot? A hundred percent. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember when we, when, when we, when I first started speaking and thank you for bringing me back to that, I said there was on the positive side and there was also on the negative side. So mm -hmm. what not to do and um, eliminating <laughs> negativity is a big theme of mine in general on Twitter, this and that. And I, I think I take a pretty radical perspective, but um, I completely agree with you. I mean, setting boundaries, eliminating negativity, no criticism, no constructive criticism, no negativity at all in your relationships. And I'm very, very um, strict on that. I know it's, it may seem like a, you know, people, it probably, it, the, the reaction I get is probably when you tell somebody that they can't even have a little bit of milk in their coffee in the morning if they're trying to, <laughs> no milk in my coffee, what are you, crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Brian, if that's your approach, but I know you you certainly work with people who are like that, you know. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's doing what you can do, right? If you can go without the milk, cool. If, if that's your life's meaning and milk makes you happy, then I'm not going to say don't ever drink milk again. If you say having a donut every month is good, okay, don't do it every day. If you smoke two packs a day, can we get down to one? <laughs> you, you can't have like, you know, and and... You know, that may be an area that I think it's interesting because for me, my best friends, my best relatives, and my wife will call me out and go, Brian, look, like I may be saying something to my daughter and she looks at me like, don't say it. <laughs> don't say what you're going to say right now. Right. And and so, so there's, and, and it's always respectful, but it's like, oh, I'm think I, I'm glad I didn't say that because I didn't understand the whole situation. Right? I didn't understand what happened. I could have said something that would be hurtful, not meaning to be hurtful because it, it's just not having tact. Maybe. Right. Yeah. There's always ways to get your needs met and your um, desires um, expressed without going negative. Mm -hmm. you know? And there's always ways. There's always ways of saying it, whether you appeal to emotion, whether you appeal to your personal experience, whether you appeal to your opinion. Like, um, but, but the idea of criticism, I mean, you guys, I'm sure are familiar with John Gottman, the most famous marriage therapist on the planet. 
uh, you know, he, he came up with what's called the four horsemen of the relationship apocalypse. And basically, you know, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling are the four ingredients, which he is clinically, like through um, evidence-based th- uh, evidence uh, research, shown directly has an impact on the success of a person's marriage. And so my position is that we don't want to ever criticize our spouse. We don't ever want to speak disrespectfully. I do a lot of work with men who um, are being spoken to disrespectfully and don't even realize it. You know, it's like a big thing. They don't even, it's happening and they just think, well, she got a little bit upset and it works both ways. I I just happen to have a lot of male clients, um, you know, that, that I deal with in this particular issue and just, you know, realizing, you know, what is disrespectful speech? What, when am I speaking to somebody in a way that's negative? What is criticism? Big, a big, uh, it's in how to rephrase things, you know, even for a mansplaining, let's just say mansplaining, you know, I'd stop mansplaining in my opinion, you know, people could still call me a mansplainer, that's fine. But it's at least in my relationships with my wife, you know, I will preface things, well, I totally understand the way you're doing it, I get it, but this is the way I would do it if I were to do it. Do you see that's not like totally different than, well, I think you should do this. Mm-hmm. Completely different energy, totally yeah. different way of saying it. Totally understand what you're doing. I see why you would do it that way. If you're asking me, this is the way that I would handle the situation. There's like a very big energetic difference there. Mm-hmm. There's no criticism. There's no judgment. Oh, that's so stupid. How could you have done that? I can't believe you did that. You know, all these things that mm-hmm. we say that bring distance between each other. Mm-hmm. And I think Dover, that is such a huge point because the reason I started the Life's Best Medicine podcast is I was looking on Twitter and I was noticing if I said something about hope, faith, things are going to be better, three days would be arguments. Like people would say, well, you're a jerk. You, you, you're giving people false hope. It's like, give them some hope. If you say everyone's going to die of COVID, say, look, respect COVID, but don't live in fear and lock yourself in your basement and never do anything. And, and so it's like, because there's, I have to look at the big picture. There's negative effects of that. I just saw something on Twitter this morning. It's like the guy says the average suicidal ideation in his practice was about 3%. Now it's 24, 25% wow. during this. And you're like, wow, that is like, it's scary. And, and so, but you know, part of it, I have seen the negativity out there and especially towards religion, any religion uh, against uh, uh, marriage, against men, white men in particular. <laughs> and you say, and you know, the thing is I've seen this and, and the danger that I've seen is once we generalize a people, if you say all African Americans are this way or all police are this way, they're not all that way. There, there, there's no, I've never seen one group where everyone's exactly the same and they all have the same thoughts. We're all individuals. So like Martin Luther King said, I'm saying, saying respect, you know, have, have respect and, and look at the content of their character, not whatever, if they're married or single or whether it's that, you know, so I see it, even in the low carb community, people say, well, like you said, if you have milk, then you're not low carb. If you do this, you're not a carnivore because you had an avocado one day and people get so we divide ourselves so much rather than saying, well, let me, you're Muslim and let me hear your perspective, right? Because I just had a great conversation with a Muslim doctor about his interactions with Christians or his interactions with other people. And when we start to identify more with our spouse, even seeing it through their eyes, say, why is she upset when I say that? Right. And, and you start understanding, oh, I get it. That triggers what dad said or whatever it is, you know? Totally. Totally. You know, and, 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 um, you know, respect for each other's positions, you know, that was a big awakening that I had, you know, when I was, I think many men, when they hit their forties, the world starts opening up to them in a way that it wasn't before. You know, we were young, we're full of testosterone, we're full of this energy, and then we find a wife and we build a career. And then all of a sudden at 40 years old, which is like, wait a second, you know, (laughs) you know, it's kind of like at some point when the rocket ship takes off, and it, let's just say the rocket launched at like one degree off angle, right? So for the first 15 seconds, it doesn't realize that it's, you know, <laughs> but at some point, and I think that it's men around 40 years old, they realize, wait a second, <laughs> I'm over here. And the life I thought I wanted <laughs> was over here, you know, until then, you know, 20s and 30s, they're kind of like still close enough to think that they're you know, going to get that. And that is oftentimes a big awakening, in my opinion, for the men that I work with. And it certainly was for myself, somewhere around my early 40s. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started to realize that, you know, the way I saw the world wasn't the way that everybody sees the world. And the way I see my life, even just for my own personal development, it doesn't have to be that way. It can be something different. 
And Brian, it sounds like that's something that happened to you as well, where you just decided at some point you're going to stop with this practice that you were working with and you had other values that you wanted to focus on and, and you made the money wasn't as important to you at some point. And, and I kind of went through the same thing in my life where it's like I was working as a workaholic and just constantly trying to build a living. And then I looked at some of my children, I'm like, wow, I don't really spend time with them as much as I, as I want to, you know, and how, all these years have slipped by. And, uh, you know, I radically, I read Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Workweek. I don't know if you've ever read that book, you know. And yeah. uh, my wife and I were just like, that's it. Four-hour workweek for me. <laughs> I, I didn't quite go down to four hours, but I came home. I started making breakfast for my kids every morning before they went to school. And I was there for them. And then I would come home for dinner and started participating with them and things on weekends. I put down some of the work. And... Uh, it just was a shift, you know, and when we all open up our eyes to the different realities that other people are living in, choose goodwill and good feelings towards each other. Mm -hmm. So many possibilities are open toward for us. Mm -hmm. And being able to do this with my wife, right? And be able to mm -hmm. sit down and have, I was leaving at 4.30 in the morning for work every day. And then I get home and the kids would get home late and they want to talk. I'm like, it's like, guys, I'm in bed, I'm done, right? But it's important. But now, you know, our schedules are so different that we can kind of have that time. So, you know, having coffee in the morning with my wife is something for 17 years. I never really, except on the weekends, but during the week, I'm like, I'm not going to say, let's get up at three 30 and have coffee together and then I'll go to work. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of people I think are so, especially doctors, I really have compassion because I know how it is and it's hard because you don't want to learn stuff. But, but the reality is that a few things and I'm slower than everyone else because it took me until I was almost 50 to figure this stuff out. Right. Everyone else gets it at 40 apparently. So I'm 10 years behind. But, you know, you start realizing, and my priority was always home, but I, I like would rush and try to get stuff done so I could be home. But it was a sacrifice. So it was like my kids had some in school. It's like, oh, crud, man, they got some. Like, oh, my kids were swimmers. So the whole weekend, I'd be at a swim meet, right? And they swim for like 10 minutes out of the entire weekend. But it was like we're there. But when you look back, it's quality time that I was forced to spend because I couldn't be at work. I had to be there, right, for my kids. And so, and, and some people do miss out on that. I know my dad missed out a lot of stuff because he was building to show his, to support his family and, and work hard. So he wasn't there for football games and things. And, you know, those things, I, and I think having grace for people and understanding, look at their situation. They're like, they either pay their bills. If they went to all your football games, they couldn't pay the bills and you lose your house. There, there's consequences to some of these things too. So it's finding that balance, right? Because mm -hmm. I could say I only want to work four hours a week, but then I lose everything because I'm only working four hours a week. And, and mm -hmm. but part of it's being how efficient we are and focused and, and um, you know, it, it's, it's surprising. And I wonder how, and I always think of this, when someone is attacking people constantly on Twitter or wherever they are, social media and stuff, it's like, what kind of quality of life do they really have? Because for me to say, I love Dovid, I love what you're doing, and I encourage you, instead of saying, well, you didn't do this right, I don't agree with you, right? I mean, you can disagree, there's not a problem, but respectfully saying, oh, my life, it's like you said, here's how I see it, <laughs> right? I can't argue with the way you see it. If I have a guy who's vegan, who's healthy, and has all this muscle, and he's living a great life, I don't say that's, that's wrong, you're living your life long. Or if he's a different faith, I don't say you're living, if you're a train wreck, I might say, you might want to consider some of these things, <laughs> right? I mean, totally. yeah. And like, that's, that's really, you know, an interesting twist on marriage that I believe that, you know, I try to espouse, um, you know, oftentimes husband and wife will kind of, um, we feel justified in our um, anger or our negativity sometimes. And, and, and thank God I'm not hearing a lot of that from you, but I, every couple is familiar with that, you know, where, you know, he did this or he did that. And, and it's almost like when a person comes to me and they want me to fix their spouse, which is usually usually a big part of when people come in the front door, they're like, well, I need you to speak to him about this and speak to him about that or her about this and her about that. And it's a paradigm shift for people to, when I try to convince them that, uh, and, I, and I say this in a pretty radical way just to get the point across, you know, if I'm happy with my wife, and she's not happy with me. So my wife's angry at me, but I love her. Who's the winner? Me. Oh, because I'm married to somebody whom I love mm -hmm. and I can't wait to see. Okay, hold on. Mm -hmm. I know this is a little. <laughs> if she's happy with me and I'm angry with her, who's the winner? She is. She is. 
Yeah. Because she's married to somebody who she can't wait to be with. She wants to be intimate with. She loves. She appreciates. The happy one is the winner. Oftentimes people come into my office and they think, well, I'm the one who's justified. I'm the one who's right. I'm on the upper and he did this, he did that. And I say, there's always, how does he feel about you? Well, well, he doesn't think there's anything wrong. He thinks everything's fine. I said, oh, so he's happy in the relationship and you're not. (laughs) So I said, so he's winning the marriage game, basically. You know, and that usually causes a shift in the way people think, see things because they usually mm-hmm. look at themselves as like, you know, um, the, the, the justified one. Mm-hmm. So that's why I like, I love to work with couples on like what you were saying before in terms of Twitter. You know, if you wake up in the morning and you're feeling these negative feelings, you're the loser, mm-hmm. not the person whom you feel the mm-hmm. negative feelings towards. They're fine. Mm-hmm. They're happy mm-hmm. whether or not you wake up upset or not. So we want to, if we want happiness, if we want to be a pleasant person and a person with a smile on her face, and it's the same thing. I had to say this. If we're talking marriage here and we're talking health, I'll do the same thing. It's the same thing with sex, right? If you're happy, if meaning, if my, uh, if, 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 if I desire my wife, right, if I think she's gorgeous and beautiful and sexy and lovely and perfect, and she doesn't feel desire towards me, who's the loser? She is. She is. She's yeah. married to somebody she doesn't like. That sucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It yeah. sucks. I feel sorry for anybody who's <laughs> married to somebody she doesn't like. Right? So you see all these men trying to get their wives to desire them, trying to get their wives to, to look at them in a certain way. I explained to both men and women, your job is to be the one who looks at your partner with those starry Mm -hmm. eyes because that makes you happy. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they will do the same for you if Mm -hmm. they want to be happy. Mm -hmm. So it's like a twist a little bit on the typical way that we, you know, jump into relationships, the way that we look Mm -hmm. at at our partner. It's a little bit of a twist. Always the one who's the happiest is the winner. Not that we're in a competition, but just for the sake of this conversation, the one who desires more, loves more, lusts more, is smiles more, compliments more, be that person. Because that means that you're happy. Isn't that what you want after all? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think most of the time that's going to win the other person over, like there's acts of service and being kind and decent because mm-hmm. I've seen it. As a matter of fact, Lenovo will, will vouch for this one. We were at a small group with a group of people and there's one guy, older guy, retired fireman, stands up and goes, hey guys, just want to let you know I'm leaving my wife. I'm like, really? And he goes, and I feel great about it. I'm at peace with it. I go, really? And I called him out because I was like, I was surprised. I go, how? Like if I have a friend for um, a year and we our friendship dissolves, I feel there's sadness. He goes, I have zero sadness. Everything's great. And I was like, wow. But in talking with them, he said, she never serves me, never. And so we kind of said, well, have you ever thought about serving her, even though she's a miserable person? And then he, you could see the, and he would come to the group by himself. And so anyways, over time, they fell in love, madly back in love again, because he said, Which, can I get you a coffee? And she was stunned. Like, <laughs> he would just get up and get his own coffee. He's like, forget, like they live in, a, it was miserable, right? It really was. But once he started being nice to her, she's like, well, he was nice to me. She said, hey, I'm going to go get some to eat. Do you want me to pick you up something? And that changed everything because oh, yeah. he was kind despite that she was a jerk. And it's like kind of like that whole thing about loving your enemy and, and you know, being kind to your neighbors. Like you're nice, your neighbors are nice back to you. It's kind of the, there was an old story I heard that, you know, this, this chief is standing at the edge of his kingdom and, and this guy walks up and he has all this stuff with him. And he says, hey, I'm looking for a new place to live. What's your kingdom like? And he said, where do you come from? He said, everyone's miserable. They took advantage of me, treated me poorly. And it was a miserable existence. I couldn't wait to get out of there. And he said, unfortunately, you'll find the same people here. Yeah. <laughs> and a few hours later, another guy comes up and, and he has all of his stuff with him. And he asks what it's like to live in the kingdom. And the king says, where do you come from? He said, where I come from, everyone was kind and decent and nice. And we loved each other and supported, but it was just time for me to leave. He said, welcome, you'll find the same people here, <laughs> right? Because awesome. it's what you make of your life at some mm-hmm. point, you know? And I mm-hmm. see that where, where these people are miserable and they, they hate everyone and they're, they're angry of what you eat or what you think or what you believe, or if you have faith. Uh, but you see that reflect in their life. The fruit of their life is that they're bitter everywhere they go. 100%. Yeah. And the amazing thing is some of these people have the most followers on social media because I think people like to see the train wrecks or the, mm-hmm. I don't know what it is. Like, you know, like in politics, you see the nastiness and was like, this is terrible, but it gets votes, right? And unfortunately, or they say the violence in the movies or the sexism, 
but we're buying those products and they're they're giving us what we want and then we criticize yeah. them for making what we're demanding mm -hmm. if that makes sense a hundred percent well you know think about the gladiator days you know no one would come stadiums wouldn't fill to see uh, a lion and a, and a warrior you know sitting down with each other and you know sharing a snack of beef right they only came <laughs> to see them with each other apart that's, the that's only true reason. yeah <laughs> And uh, yeah, and, and of course, you know, this, you know, after the gratitudes, like Linnell, you were mentioning, um, you know, certainly eliminating criticism and, and, uh, and speaking respectfully is a, a huge piece, but there's follow-ups to gratitude. Gratitude is good, but it's speech, right? So what mm -hmm. we want, what we want to morph that into eventually is action. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to go from the speech to the action. And so mm -hmm. acts of kindness, you know, another thing, like as an example, one of the homework assignments that's the, the follow-up is okay, I want you to take on one or two things that you think your wife would appreciate if you did for her every day. Just, it could be anything. It could be taking out the garbage without being asked. It could be making her breakfast. It could be giving her a back massage or it could be leaving her alone for an hour, you know, so that she could get her, you know, reading time in whatever it is that she's, you think would be helpful for her. You know, put your words into deed. Mm -hmm. And and oftentimes, you know, and, and I'm talking about relationships where there's, it's contentious, you know, and it's uncomfortable, but mm -hmm. you'd be amazed. I had this one guy, it was very, very funny, you know, uh, his wife used to be bothered when he would go to bed and there'd be dishes in the sink. So what was his homework assignment? He had to do the dishes every night, but he didn't just do the dishes every night. He took a picture of the sink, the clean sink, and he sent it to her. He sent her a text message with the clean sink. And he would just write, I love you every night. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, boom <laughs> in, her, in her inbox. So she knew that he was doing something that he didn't normally do. Mm -hmm. There was no taking, there was no kind of confusion in the morning mm -hmm. and better I didn't know who did the dishes. It was every night that she felt that she was being attended to, mm -hmm. you know, in action. And, you know, she, of course it adds to the positivity. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the whole idea is to create this foundation of positivity and thought and an action and through like you said Linnell, you know respectful speech no mm -hmm. criticism these are the fun these are the basics of marriage that everybody needs to be successful in a relationship mm -hmm. yeah i mean this mm -hmm. stuff's critical and, and it's not just the marriage relationship because if i get into a fight with my wife every day before i go to work i'm not gonna be as happy and nice of a person at work right and and the other thing and, and you've probably seen these studies with the dog if they put a dog in a cage where it can you know, if you shock it on the one side of the cage, it jumps to the other side of the cage. And then if you shock it on that side, it jumps to the other side. To, but if you keep randomly shocking on both sides of the of this wall, it just lays down and takes it. So yeah. I see some people where work is their refuge. They get they get away from their mean spouse and terrible family, alcoholic husband, whatever, and work is their their sanctuary. And then they go home and they have disaster. Or other people, it's the opposite. They hate their job. And that, that was more my side. My home was my sanctuary. But if I'm working 14 hour days, I don't, I'm only spending an hour. That, that's what I, I started reasoning is like, I'm only spending an hour or two with people that I love the most. And like, they're going to, they're going to be the ones at my funeral, not people that I'm you yeah. know, doing <clears throat> crazy yeah. paperwork for the insurance company, right. Or whatever it is. So you start realizing, gosh, I got to have some life balance, take care of yourself. And this is, this is the whole thing about what low carb MD is about and what life's best, uh, medicine is this i forget the name of my own podcast life's best medicine is look what works for you ultimately what works for you what gives you peace what makes you a better person what makes you a better community member what makes you see the world differently because i think what i'm seeing is a lot of people see the world very negatively and that everything's terrible and there's there aren't good people out there and i've been to some of the most war-torn you know uh, ms-13 neighborhoods and i've seen the greatest people on earth there and that's why i want to share these stories of seeing People are going in there and helping. Like 9-11, people were running into those buildings to save lives. They didn't say, are you, are you Jewish? Are you Christian? Are you? No, they just said, there's a life I want to save and I want to help this person. And so, so many, I, I see this, this overwhelming uh, uh, negativity and darkness that we have to bring some light to the world. Like I see your tweets. That's why I wanted to have you on because I love when you say, look, have you seen it this way, guys? Have you look at it this perspective? And, and being positive, I think it's, it's sad to me that because we're positive, we stand out. And it should be like, right, that should be the general rule and not the, the negativity should stand out, but that becomes the norm. So my, my, my joke was, and, and this is really kind of convicted me. I said something about, you know, having faith and taking a step at a time, that kind of thing. And it caused a three-day Twitter war 
But Tro, my partner on the podcast, is a New Yorker. He says the F word all the time, and no one blinks an eye. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's normal, right? So I was like, wow, one F word causes all kinds of strife, and the other F word, no one cares about it anymore because it's yeah. so. And, and, and along the F word stuff, it's funny because our kids, when, when they were young, we never cuss. We don't cuss at the house, right? So they never heard bad words. So my dad and my brothers were playing cards, and you know the language got salty and stuff. And and. Uh, He's they're, they're F this, F that. And they, they had no idea what it meant because they were little. But then my dad said, yeah, this dumb guy that I talked to. And, and she looked at me and said, oh, my gosh, he called someone dumb. That's not nice. <laughs> and we were laughing because it's so funny because they had no idea what the other words meant. Because yeah. They weren't exposed to it, you know? Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Interesting. I'm listening to both of you guys talk. And, um, and I mean, you could, you could use this health-wise, diet-wise, or relationship wise, but I'm hearing a lot back and forth about um, how, you know, if you're eating a certain way, it's, it's sacrificial. I mean, there's sacrifices you have to make, you know? Um, and if you're working on a relationship marriage, um, it's sacrificial and you have to be willing to, to um, look outside of yourself and sacrifice for, for the betterment of um, your marriage. Um, and then I'm also hearing taking personal responsibility, you know, whether it's eating a certain way, you take personal responsibility, you sacrifice, or if you're working on a marriage, um, taking personal responsibility. I think, I don't know what it was, Dovid, you had said something that made me realize, yeah, there was a time I have to do this every single day. I have to take personal responsibility every day at some point in the day for, um, my attitude, my my responses. I mean, if we're talking marriage, Brian can say something to me, um, and man, I can go from zero to ten like that. And I I've finally realized, wow, when my girlfriends say that to me, I laugh with them. My husband says that to me, and I go to ten, and that can't be about them. And really, the comment. Um, I could make the excuse it was the way you said it, but really I when when I get angry or I get upset, I've learned, I've been disciplined to learn to look at myself first. You know, why did I respond? Instead of I think we so easy to point the finger, you know, um, at the other person because that doesn't require personal responsibility. It doesn't require us to be uh, humble. You know, it's so easy to just blame or point. And I've trained myself. I've learned it's healthier for my marriage. It's healthier me um, when I can say, all right, why did I respond so strongly to that? You know, and look at that. Um, oh, that I can usually sometimes I can't put a finger on it, but at least I can say, all I know is my girlfriends have said that to me, and I don't respond like that. My husband says it's got to be more about me than about him. Um, and so just, and then sometimes I can put my finger on it. You know, I can either say, you know, my dad used to say those things to me, and and I felt like it it was unkind, and you know, this or that, but my husband isn't my dad. <laughs> you might say those same words, but I can't respond the same way. You know, it's, it's, so I think, I think um, just in hearing you guys talk, those words were coming to me, just taking personal responsibility, um, really being able to, instead of immediately wanting to blame or point the finger, like what part of that is about me? And if I can figure that out, maybe I'm not even upset anymore with my husband. You know, maybe I misblamed him for it or, you know, and then just the sacri knowing that it's, it's sacrificial, um, relationships are sacrificial and being willing to sacrifice, um, the right things, you know, um, and then taking, you know, that personal responsibility. That's so beautifully said, Lanelle. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just very deep. And, and this is what, you know, this is the, the, the beauty of what marriage brings to each of each one of us as individuals, because, it's through this bond that we have with each other that gives us the strength and the will and the desire to look inside and to challenge who we are as a person. Mm -hmm. I always compare marriage to climbing Mount Everest. It's the, it's the, you're with somebody else, but it's the hardest personal journey you'll ever take. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, you just said it so, so well, and you just expressed it so perfectly, you know, we're only forced 
to really look inside and change, like you just mentioned about yourself, change your responses, change, examine those personal uh, issues and the deep soul level, you know, fears and traumas and, and reactions and you know, negative self images only through the power of, in my opinion, a male female dynamic in a committed bonded long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful, you know, it's a wonderful journey that we are privileged to take mm -hmm. somebody else who's willing to be that person for you and be that, doormat at times for you while you're working on your own junk you know i'm sure you've said things to brian that have not been kind in the least you know what i'm sure brian is mm -hmm. lost maybe his. once or twice i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but that and, and, and what you're saying this journey and if you look at it that way it's like look <laughs> this is a person carrying half my load for me, right? We're carrying the load together. And, and I think part of it's enjoying the journey, not saying, okay, when we make this much money or we're worth this place and then we'll be happy. It's like, be happy on the journey. And that's, this ties back into the low carb community, ties back to, you know, um, life in general. It's like, enjoy the journey. I have so many people like, I lost one pound and they're miserable. It's like, that's this week. Let's see what happens next week. And if you had a, a little less weight loss this week, next week's gonna be better. Let, let's, mm -hmm. because this negativity gets in people's brain. And plus, life experience of failing diets of failing all this stuff and that's their life experience they're they're anticipating that it's not going to go well and it's hard to overcome this this negativity and and this this mindset that things aren't going to go well and it's hard and and i think in a marriage relationship you say okay every day is not going to be a perfect day on that adventure but then you say okay tomorrow's going to be a better day let's let's figure it out and and i think too we learned a lot i learned a lot because my nature is like if, if dovid and i have if we have a problem i'm going to say dovid i have a problem and here's why right her family was more the elephant is sitting in the room and no one talks about it. like does no one see that this is a problem and like my family was just more communicative of that and some families <laughs> i see it's like other ones it's like you know like tro and i go how do you and tro get along you're so different but i love someone like tro who just says look here's all i say boom and throws it out there rather than someone goes yeah yeah you're right brian and then walks down and goes you're an idiot you have no idea what you're talking at least let me express my views right patients like that i love patients who call me on and go why are you saying low carb and i have to explain to them Otherwise, they leave and go, yeah, you're, you're right, doctor, because they don't want confrontation. And then they're upset all day because you said something that, you know, I'd rather have some confront me. And, and so that's something we had to learn, too. And I've learned from Linnell, and she's learned from me. It's like, I would rather go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, figure it out, and then you go and hang out together, and you're done with it, move on. But some people need to step back from that conflict and reflect and think and, and cool down or whatever it is. And, and so you kind of learn each other over, over mm -hmm. time of what works. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating because in the, from a spiritual perspective, you know, a marriage is the reunification of a single soul, but with the inhibitions of two different bodies. Mm -hmm. So our souls are one. Mm -hmm. They're the same, but the, the opposite side of the same soul. But our bodies are so different. Our physicality is what keeps us apart. Because I communicate my way, like you were just mentioning, and Linnell communicates her way, and I want to see the world this way. These, those are not soul-level messages. Those are just me and my personality. It's the physical manifestation of mm -hmm. the body that God has chosen that my soul is going to reside in. And the, the trick about marriage is bringing these two physical beings mm -hmm. into the same level of unity as your soul already has. Mm -hmm. you know, and to do that, mm -hmm. we have to work. It's, it's not going to happen by itself. We were not fashioned as two perfect puzzle pieces that just go like this. Mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. We have to create that puzzle piece. You know, we have to create that perfect fitting. And that's going to mean I've got to cut off this little piece of who mm -hmm. I am. And mm -hmm. one, one woman said to me in therapy, she goes, well, if I say that to my husband, I'm not being authentic. I'm not being the real me. I said, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> You're not being the real. You're married now. How old are you? <laughs> you know, what's going on over? What, what, what did you think? You think you could just show up as you and have a happy marriage? No. You have to change. Mm -hmm. I remember once when I was in, uh, <coughs> in religious school, uh, it was my birthday, and in, in religious school, you know, the rabbis there and did this and that, and the whole little group was celebrating. So one of the boys next to me said to me, uh, you know, mazel tov on your birthday and you should grow to be a, a, a great person or a better person. So the rabbis, the rabbi, you know, everybody said l'chaim, you know, they said, you know, congrats, mazel tov. And the rabbi said, you know, fist on the table, he says, excuse me, 
He says, in, in Judaism, we don't want to grow. We're not interested in your growth. And everyone was, why, why aren't you interested in growth? Isn't that what we're here for? We learn and we study and we pray and we this and that. He says, no. He says, growing just means more of you, bigger you. Nobody wants more of you. They want you to change. We don't want growth. We want change. We want you to become a better person, a better mm-hmm. version of yourself, not mm-hmm. more of your old self. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was being a little, you know, tongue in cheek, this and that, you know, it's no big deal. But it was a mind shift, you know, it was a change of the way we see things, you know. It's mm-hmm. the same thing with your relationships. We have to, you know, personal responsibility. We mm-hmm. have to look inwards and say, okay, how can I change in order to make this situation work out better for mm-hmm. the both of us. And sometimes I find that I need to, in that moment, uh, well, let me just say this. I, I believe, I believe that marriage is a commitment. Um, I believe that if I'm, that till death do us part. I said that and I meant it. So does that mean it's going to be easy? No, but I'm committed. So I truly, in any conflict we have, I'm super intentional. Haven't always been this way. It's by practicing it and being committed to this mindset, this mentality of anything I say right now, I do not want it to destroy our marriage. I want it to build our marriage. So if I am that upset that I can't build our marriage with my words right now, I need to take a time out. And that is saying, this is about me. It's not about you right now. I am not able to respond in love, um, not because I don't love you, but because I need to figure out what's going on in me. So I think too, it's important and it's okay to give each other permission to say, this can't be resolved right now. Not because I'm so mad at you. This can't be resolved right now because I am not able to respond with the love I need to respond with. And I need to take some time for me to figure it out. Let's come back in yeah. an hour or, um, and that always allows me to like take that breather and to say, why am I so upset? Why am I crying? Why am I so frustrated? Cause it can't be about him right now. It's gotta be th- all of this is, you know, so it's okay sometimes too, to, to be able to take that, that break and give each other permission um, and to say, you know, to ask yourself why again, not always pointing the finger at the other person, you know, that personal growth you were just talking about, you know, like I, I, I think it's important that we aren't always thinking that they need to change and they need to grow. Um, It's, it's, it's a combined effort for sure. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And also on that, you know, you, you, I tell guys, look, it's like toothpaste. If you squeeze that toothpaste out, you can't put it back in, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you, be careful. Think, reflect a little bit before you just say something nasty and hurtful to people. And and that's why I think I think a lot of people just don't reflect. They see something I don't like because <clears throat> I've had times on Twitter where I really want to react. And I was like, you know, it, it's not going to be positive. It's not going to help that person. They're not. And if they they have a totally different view than me, I'm not going to con- convince them with. Yeah logic or, or sense right and you have to you, you get wisdom in that like it's sometimes it's better not to win the argument just to kind of say right mm-hmm. and, and so another one along those lines one of my good friends <clears throat> came to me one day he goes can you believe it and he was telling me about four guys who i respect who are the nicest people that i've never seen be unreasonable and he had a problem with all four of them i go huh <laughs> right <laughs> have you ever thought that maybe you're the common denominator in all this conflict and, and he was he was going through a divorce and had a, he was having a miserable time of it and he was the cause go, you're the cause of all this stuff man i'm telling you i know you and i know them and i know who's who, right so it's funny once he heard that he he changed his whole perspective and he kind of made peace with these guys and because they were trying to help him and he didn't like it because he didn't like what they were saying right so i think there's so much of that and especially in marriage it's a hard thing because you know so many times in, and i'm outnumbered at my house i've got my wife, I have two daughters and both of my dogs are female. So they all like, I'm not going to win the argument, right? I know I'm, I'm on my own. I've, at least I've do- dove it here to outnumber you, Lino. So, but, but I think that's, but that's, um, you know, in life, we have to look at that. It's like, are you a peacemaker or are you going to bring conflict wherever you go? And, and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing in people, you know, and, and Dovid, I, I want to be respectful of your time. I really appreciate this. And I, I think it's really important medicine. I, I would love to have you back, okay. you know, cause it, it, because the reason I say this, there's a lot of reasons, but one, one is from a low carb because people say, well, what does this have to do with low carb? Well, if you go home and you're stressed and you're fighting with your husband or, or, or wife and 
that affects your insulin levels, affects your stress hormones. If you're a stress eater, that's going to make you eat more. If you're with someone and you're afraid of her leaving you, you don't want to lose weight and you're sabotaging her, right? Because you're afraid of your own insecurities. These are things that, because Tro and I say the biggest uh, uh, detriment to lifestyle change, number one, stress levels. Number two, lack of family support. If you don't have family support, it's going to be very difficult because if people are eating, you know, French fries and Cokes in front of you all day and donuts, it's going to be very hard to stick to, to that. And, and it's the same thing with faith. If you're in the bar all night, it's going to be hard to, to, to stick to your faith stuff if you have an alcohol problem or, you know, whatever. You, you kind of don't put yourself in bad situations unless you could help the other people that are out of their situation type thing. Yeah. Yeah. This is, um, this is related, you know, uh, learning how to set boundaries is also, you know, we can talk about this maybe on, the, on the, another show, but, you know, the related to what Linnell was saying to what you're just saying as well, we, we part of looking inside, it could be that what I need to do for myself is not necessarily not only change a piece of me or my reaction, but also one thing that could come up is I need to learn how to set boundaries. I need mm -hmm. to ask mm -hmm. to not to be spoken to in this way or not to be treated in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that's another whole Mm -hmm. you know, realm of, you know, relationship growth where it's not just about me making your coffee every morning and it's not just about me uh, doing your love language. Those are fantastic and we should all, you know, learn how to do them and please our partner. But at the same token, sometimes it's about, you know, I f this is how I feel when I'm treated this way. Mm -hmm. What can we do about it? Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. Communicating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Communicating mm -hmm. and, and, and being clear on those things because, mm -hmm. That happens a lot too. As a matter of fact, just a quick one on the way out. <laughs> one day I'm watching the football game. I'm into it, having a good time. And then I hear the dishes sound really loud in the background somehow. And then I realized, oh, she's doing the dishes. And, and she had been doing dishes and cleaning and doing all this stuff. And I'm like, hey, is everything okay? And she was annoyed with me because she was, I've been here working for 45 minutes and you just watch the game. You don't like this what early on in our marriage. And I'm like, well, I didn't know. I'm, I'm a guy. I'm clueless. If I knew, like, if you would have asked me, I would get up and help you. But I was even, I was so focused. I can't multitask, right? So I said, here's the deal. If you want me to help you, let me know. I usually, if I don't see it, I'll, I'll do it. But if I, if I don't know, then, you know, you can't be upset with me. You got to communicate with me. And so we've had that agreement too, where she'll communicate with me or I'll communicate with her. Like this bothers me or, you know, and so, and we try our best and we have grace for each other because we're always going to blow it. If I leave my shoes in the living room or whatever, you go, okay. You know, so there's things like that where you kind of, you, you, you have enough grace and love and kindness and you want to do the right thing. And you, and you give the person the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. saying, okay, mm -hmm. she didn't do that just to annoy me. Let me look at this. Why am I triggered? Right. So there's so much like that. And I think, I, I think this is very helpful for people just to hear, because I think some people really have to reassess where they are in life. And I know I had to, and you had to, Linnell's had to, and, and now, you know, you kind of realize, okay, what, what matters really? If ultimately. we're lucky, we have to, right. If we're lucky, we get to reassess in life. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and that's why you know you never leave the the house angry you, you say i love you and you, you let people know because there's never a question if something happens we we don't know we're coming home that night you know when we leave and you know especially policemen and people on the front lines you don't know that you're going home that night so you better leave on good terms right because the worst thing is to go the rest of your life saying gosh the last thing i said to her was hurtful before she died right or whatever it is it's it's a horrible thing to go through and i think these are these are important lessons in life, and that's why you know it's so good to have your wisdom and and what you're talking about because it's this is critical to our society, our foundation of having strong family units because that's what makes our society mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Having mentors and good people out there teaching your kids the right things and mm -hmm. and what you're doing, spending time making breakfast for your kids, they won't forget that mm -mm. when you're an old man and you know on they your deathbed. Normal, right? you know? Yeah, they think that's normal. My my daughter thinks that you know her, you know she's you know her husband's going to be making her breakfast mm -hmm. every day. <laughs> you know, that's normal for them. So mm -hmm. I don't care, you know, let it be the normal. I don't care. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you set a high standard for them too, to say, mm -hmm. this is what, this is how a, a husband and a father should be. And I think that's what our role is, right? We, we want it to be that, not this domineering, like this is the way it is. This is my law. And you're, you know, because so many people think that's the way it has to be. But I think that show living by example, ultimately, like, you know, if I claim to be a Christian or, or you claim to be Jewish and you don't, you don't live that way. People are going to look at you and go, why do I want to live like that if he's a jerk to everyone, right? And I think that's the problem is we've been stereotyped people of faith is that, that you're a jerk to everyone, you're out to get everyone and you're a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites. So I think it's that kind of stuff we have to say, hey, look, look at the fruit of someone's life. And I look at someone and go, he's happy. He's doing well. He's, he's well adjusted. He's, he's having a good time with his family and, and, and still bringing an income home, things like that. You, you kind of, 
yeah. you realize, I think I see so many, as a matter of fact, I was just talking to someone and they were upset because all their friends have an Aston Martin in their driveway and they're driving a Mercedes. Like, come to my neighborhood. You'll feel really good about yourself because we, <laughs> you know, people are parking on the lawn or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it, it's, it's really what matters what it comes down to. Yeah. My wife's a middle school principal, so I know she has to go do her oh, wow. life duties and all that. But Linnell, thanks so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. such a, you're, you're so much cuter than Tro. Yeah, it's so <laughs> nice. So nice. This is it's been a pleasure. To These, I do have to go because I have to go uh, run a school right now. But I wanted to leave because I thought this was profound. And I think it's... Um, these will be my parting words and then I'll, I'll sign off and then you guys can continue. I don't know if, you, how, if you're how, how long you're going to continue for. But um, Dovid, I have really been listening to the language that you've been speaking this whole time. And there are such key words that communicate so powerfully to our spouse, to our children. Um, and in the middle of this somewhere, um, you, you said at some point in time, I realized that, um, you know, my life was, was busy. It was, I, I wasn't able to spend the time with my children that I wanted to. You didn't say that I felt like I should have been, or I thought it would, I had to. It's that choice of language that speaks, I want you. I, I love you. Um, so, and you've said that several times, you've used that word, I get to. So, um, you know, I always, I, I am very um, in tune to that language because it speaks, um, it's, it, it speaks powerfully either life or death. You know, it speaks powerfully either way. Well, I, I should go. I'll, I'll try to be at your performance or I'll, I'll try to be able to make you breakfast because I know that I'm the parent and that's, that's the, I should be doing that, you know, rather than I will, I will be intentional to be there because I want to be, you know, um, and just having that, that perspective of, and, and being very intentional and careful with the language that you use. Um, because like I said, that speaks to our spouse or to whoever, a friend, your children. Um, it, it either speaks, you know, like you're valued and you're loved and I love you and I want to be there. Um, as opposed to, um, it's an obligation or I feel, you know, so, yeah, awesome. um, yeah. All right. Thank you. It was, Ooh. it was great spending the hour with you, honey. I love you. I'll see you. Love uh, you too. We'll see you I'll tonight. See you later. Okay. All right. Have bye -bye. a great day. Hey, can you log me out or I'll just click leave. All right. Bye-bye guys. <laughs> bye. Dovid, hey, thank, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure having you on. And, and, uh, you know, how do people find you and get to track you down and, uh, you know, Sure, sure. I mean, the get easy, you to help them. Yeah, yeah. The easiest way to find me is just first name, last name um, on Google. So it's davidfeldman.com. Uh, that's I have a, a wonderful website with a great blog. I have 60 plus articles. If you sign up for my email list, I've got some great, very helpful downloads to you know, help, help your marriage. And if you want to have a good time, a lot of fun, come find me on Twitter where all the action is at david, D O V I D Feldman. And, uh, Join the big party. It's a party every day. On <laughs> lots of conversations, lots of great discussions, lots of interesting tweets. Uh, I have I have a podcast which you can find on my website, um, the Impassioned Marriage, and that's on Apple and Spotify and all those different things. But um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure, Brian. And I think we, you and I, have a lot in common. I'd love to come on another time if you want, and uh, we could really you know get to know each other even better. Yeah, it's a given. I love I love your approach and 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 it's helpful. And I get free marriage, marital counseling. This is kind of cool, man. I, I I knew starting a couple of podcasts might help me. Um, speaking of which, Cynthia Thurlow. The only reason I know about you is through her, right? And what she's doing with everyday wellness and and she's doing a lot of positivity in the community. She has a lot, you know, a lot of times I see her tweets and it lifts me up that day. And so I want my listeners to to you know support her and and what she's doing. And she's been a big help to to me, and I've been a help to her on a couple of occasions. And I think it's it's so important that we just really up uplift people who have a positive message right yeah. and i've been yeah. saying david instead of david i, I got to get it right man perfect. david is perfect david david. Is either one is fine. so yeah and, and i appreciate you know what you're doing and, and i've seen that and that's why i want the people like you that have positivity that that are helping lives and helping marriage and helping people to live better lives because the marriage relationship is so critical in your longevity in your life and your health and, and all that and so you know how often do doctors ask you how are things at home Right. And that's been one thing that has been really enlightening to me because I could, that tells me a lot about 
the character of the person and what's going on at home and, and why they're having certain health conditions. So it does all tie together because like you said, that the spirit, the mind, the soul are, are not disconnected from your physical health. So people going through divorces and, and bitter at home, they're going to have more TMJ, tight neck, tight backs, back pain, you know, heartburn, acid reflux, can't sleep. And all these things affect everything. So this is how it all ties into the health. That, that relationship is going to reflect in all of your other relationships and how you perform at work and how you, you know, perform with the kids and how, how it's a huge deal. So, so your work is really critical. So it's an honor and I would love to have you back on and, you know, we'll grab some topics and, and really, I think, I think this is part of life's best medicine, doing what you're doing. So we all play our role and I play this little tiny role and you play this huge role because it does affect health significantly. I see. Okay. <laughs> all right. And have a great day and a great weekend. I greatly appreciate you joining me. God bless you. Take care. God bless you.